All right, this is a missionary pastor, Roland Mitchum, for Nanaimo, uh, excuse me, in Nanaimo for Harbor Baptist Church. This is our Wednesday night service. We're in 1 Corinthians 23 to 25. For those of you who have been with us, um, uh, it was a, 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 a clipper accident, okay? That's all I'm going to say. It had to. It just happened. Anyway, <clears throat> you should understand that. Now, for those of you who uh, come out to our Easter service, uh, praise the Lord for you and thank you for that. I am sorry. I apologize in, 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 in sackcloth and ashes, if you would, because I had no idea that we were going to be facing uh, the temperatures that we did with all that wind and stuff. But I do appreciate your heart. And I'm sure God will bless you for your willingness to be there. Um, uh, but it took me a while to warm up to, by the way. All right. So we're in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14. And we're going to look tonight in verses 23 through 25. And uh, <clears throat> let me go ahead and read the passage. And uh, uh, if therefore the whole church come together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? Uh, this is a rhetorical question, okay? This is what we start with, uh, and then we go on to how he replies to this. Um, but if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of, his, of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. <clears throat> uh, what we have here, he starts off with a rhetorical question in 23, and then as he, as he lists down, he, he, he's telling you what happens when we preach and teach the Word of God as we should. Um, so what we have here in 23 is a common, I, I entitled this, A Question of Common Sense. Um, the purpose, I believe, that God has this message for us tonight is to help us as his children, the Christians, to understand that our lives do produce a testimony that will either have a positive or negative effect on people for Christ's sake. And so um, uh, before I go any further, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for those that are able to join with us. We ask now, Father, for your blessings, for your guidance, for your direction. I thank you so much. For the heart of the people, I thank you so much for their willingness to um, not allow the weather to distract them and, and to come out. But Lord, we ask tonight that you would give me clarity of thought and speech and that you would allow uh, the hearer to, to be able to, to be attentive and that you could, the Spirit of God would apply this to their hearts and change them for eternity's sake. We love and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um. I start off with the question uh, myself, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, is it because you want to be free and do whatever comes natural to you? Uh, do you uh, desire to live your life for you? If that is the situation, if that is your mindset, what you do is going to be motivated by your flesh. Because the purpose of all that is in your life, if that's your mindset, if that's what you're doing, Everything in your life, the purpose of it is for you. Um, that means nothing in your life. Uh, it means nothing is in your life uh, that its purpose is not to promote you. Uh, its purpose is, is not to give you pleasure. So my question would be beside that, after uh, why are you doing what you're doing, is how does that affect what people uh, believe about your God, your testimony, your church? Um, it, you could say faith in that. I, I didn't put it in here, but it, the implication is there. In truth, many people claim to believe in God. Um, I mean, you ask most anybody, and well, I say most anybody, it's probably not true here, but uh, a lot of people will tell you they believe in God. But yet, when you examine their lives, they live like the devil. I mean, uh, you might ask me, said, well, how in the world can you say that? Um, brother, how, how can you say that they live like the devil? Well, it's very easy. Um, I know this because the devil tells us uh, to do what feels good. Well, what, what, what feels good to you? Just go ahead and do it. Um, but whatever you makes you happy, just go ahead and do it. 
Uh, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry about being disciplined. Don't worry about anything. Just do what you want to do. Don't worry about the consequences. That's strictly of the devil. That's worldly. That's fleshly. Um, uh, you might have uh, the thought in your mind when you get up in the morning, I can sleep a little longer. I don't need my devotions now. I can do them later. Um, I can go to ch church later. There's always another Sunday. Life goes on as it always does. See, the question Paul puts forth in 23 is really a common sense question. He says, if therefore the whole church come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, those that don't know other languages, those that may not have had the, the, the not necessarily intelligence, but it could be, those that have not have access to, to higher learning or, or been able to go, um, they had people that were enslaved or whatever, indentured servants. He said, and unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? A redundant question. Of course they will. And, and, and the answer to his question being yes, uh, they'll believe the church is mad. Why do we come up with that? Why do we say that? Because the fruit of those actions he's talking about um, is disorder and confusion, which is madness by any um, rational definition. Now, you can say, well, well, brother, I don't really believe that. Well, let me give you a real-life illustration that happened to me. When I was young, I hadn't been saved, but uh, maybe a month, if that, I had a young uh, friend of mine. Well, let me just change that. He was a friend of mine, about the same age, <clears throat> and he um, had gotten saved, too, and he was going to a church uh, real close to our home, and, and they were Pentecostal holiness. Uh, I'd never been into one, and he invited me to go. I knew I was Baptist, but I didn't want to go. My father influenced me. He said, go ahead, go. Be good for you. And so what they wanted to, he invited me for was a, a breakfast, a men's breakfast um, for Saturday morning. So I get down there. I talk to the pastor, a friendly group of men, probably about 20 men in there, maybe not quite that many. And then the pastor asked me if I'd be willing to pray for the breakfast. I said, well, sh you know, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I was kind of on the spot. I couldn't say no. So I began to pray. And lo and behold, the moment I opened my mouth to start praying, every man in there started shouting to the top of their voice like they were in some type of competition praying as well. And of course, the pastor was trying his best to be louder than the rest, but he had some pretty good competition. I mean, they were going at it. <clears throat> well, you know what was in my mind? I stopped for a second when that happened. And I'm thinking, have these people gone mad? It was such confusion and chaos at that point. Well, mostly confusion because everybody in that room had their own mind, their own prayer, and they were all shouting. So I've experienced a little bit of what they're talking about here. And there wasn't any foreign tongues. Of course, half of them, by the time they made it to my ears, sounded foreign. But but everybody was speaking English, you know. Um <clears throat> So when I say this, he says, said, oh, would they not say that you're mad? Sure we would, because that confusion, it doesn't, it's hard to simulate all that. So anyway, let's go ahead and, and before I preach the, the, the points before I get to them, um, let's we have three points. The purpose of the church is to promote the word of God. The purpose of the word of God is to convict men of sin. And the purpose of conviction is for the worship of God. And uh, so let's go back to the first one. In verse 23, this is the question. And <clears throat> when I look at this, it says, there, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place and we all speak tongues. I want to stop there for a minute. The, the purpose of the church is to promote the word of God. So when we go in, do we speak just to speak or do we speak to teach the word of God? You know, what is the purpose that we are or, or have a gathering and we preach uh, through the word of God? Isn't it not just to speak? Oh, no, it's not, is it? It's to preach and teach the Word of God, the truth. Uh, Paul is not here. He's not condemning or forbidding the speaking of tongues. That's not what he's doing. <clears throat> he's simply asking those to whom he's speaking, what would others think? Would they not think you're mad? He knows the answer. They know the answer. Uh, the, uh, see, when tongues, no matter what language it is, if it's misused, or used without a reason, it becomes a stumbling block. And that was the whole purpose. Man, go back and study the last two ch chapters that we've been going through and how Paul's dealing. If you really take time and spend you a couple hours and think about Paul and what he's been saying in 13 and 14, especially 
if you don't want to go to 13, just go to 14 and go through the whole 14. It's, it's amazing when you get it, uh, when you look at it. Um, see, let me give you a little bit of information here. Uh, you know this, but I'm just going to call your attention because of this verse. When a person hears a lot of noise without perceiving the reason for that noise, it leads to confusion. Uh, matter of fact, it happens with a lot of things. Have you ever been going down the road at night and um, you see some lights and you can't tell whether they're coming towards you, whether they're sitting still, or the lights don't make any sense whatsoever and then kind of in your mind you're confused? Well, I have. I mean, and a lot of people I talk to will tell you the same thing. And it's not just in that. Sometimes we hear noises that are confused. Sometimes it just, it just depends on what it is. Um, but when we're, our mind cannot comprehend, it, le it gives us, we're confused. And confusion simply is, is the inability to make sense of incoming data by the mind. And that's what Paul's referring to here. When a person is confused, there, there's a lack of understanding. There's uncertainty in their mind. They don't know how to assimilate it. They don't know how to respond. See, <clears throat> this inability to understand um, leads, it, it's an inability to understand uh, not only that, but how do we are to respond. That leads um, in our mind, it leads to a haphazard or random decisions, because we're trying to figure it out. Everything's just popping. Uh, your mind's running 90 miles an hour. What happens in your mind at that point? See, when it can't assimilate, the sta this state of mind, it leads to confusion and complete disorder in the thinking. That's chaos. There's no system. There's no organization. I mean, you're jumping from one to the thing, that it, uh, your mind's just rapidly moving. Um, Chaos, now I'm going to define it for you. Chaos is, is, is the confusion and it's, uh, it's the effects. It's the effects of confusion. Um, whew. Let me see if I can get this thing and think it through so I can tell it to you. Chaos is the resulting uh, effects of, of confusion and, and how that comes out in, in a person's actions because of their mindset or in that confused mindset. It produces an unpredictable behavior because of the inability to process what the what you're, you're having to face and all. Well, think about what he's saying. If the whole church come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, they don't know the languages, they're unbelievers, they don't believe in your faith, they don't believe in God, will they not say you're mad? Can you imagine walking into a church where there's, uh, and, and we've talked about this with, I've talked about this with a few men, um, we call, they call it the kundalini spirit. People barking like dogs, laughing and carrying on, rolling on the floor. And you're having to assimilate this with, as you know, church. Or you walk into a, a building where there's a hundred people speaking in, in the same language at the same time at the top of their voice. Well, you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Anyone looking on this type of event will believe the people involved to be mad. I mean, that's the logical thought process. And Paul is alluding here, of course, to the ability of the, of the mind to understand and comprehend what people think. Um, his whole point is, I guess I should say, the, what people think of believers um, in this situation and in, in what he's looking at here in 23. Is this what God desires in our churches? Does God want people to walk in our church and think we're mad? Does God want people to walk in and that be the impression they have of our God and our service, our worship, our faith? I don't think so. And, and this is what Paul is trying to, to, to make them think. These people realize what he's saying. They're not lost. This question is not lost on them. You go back through and look at the chapter, or the last two chapters, if you would. See, there's another question here that comes up as well. What effect does this have on the name of God in the eyes of those that see this type of behavior? Uh, well, I know it. I'm going to think of the person, but what effect would this have on the name of God? You know, uh, I think it, the answer um, to the questions Paul is asking is very important. Um, this is the testimony of God before men. This is our testimony, the church's testimony. It talks about our faith. I don't want anybody to think that 
that I'm a lunatic following after a bizarre type of faith. That's not what I'm looking for, and that's not what God wants in our lives. Um, if if our testimony and the way we live uh, is an error, and, and the way we worship is not according to the Word of God, I hope you understand, at that point, it's not Christ-honoring. And if it's not Christ-honoring, it's really not worship that God will accept. It's really not worship of God. It's worship of the flesh or something else. Um, how can a testimony of confusion, of disorder and chaos bring glory and honor to God or the church or the individual? These are valid questions. When the lost or unlearned that you're speaking of here come into the service, and when they leave out, if they leave out empty, confused, or thinking we're mad, we as a as believers, as a church as a whole, have failed because that's not what we're here. We're here to promote the Word of God. We're here to bring people to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. We're here that people might know Him. And you can't do that alienating. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're alienating the people because they're prideful. Anytime a church falls into disorder and, and confusion, that means that that church body has fallen into the snare of the devil. It means that they are no longer serving God. They're no longer where God wants them. They have fallen away would probably be the proper word for it. What they do at that point, when they have um, fallen into disorder and confusion, uh, the Satan snared them, and at that point, uh, that group of people are preventing men from seeing uh, God. They're, they're preventing him them from understanding anything about God because everything at that point has become error. You say, well, you know, they said some things that were pretty good in the service, but I'll tell you what, that barking got to me. Well, you know, that just took the whole service, didn't it? Didn't matter what they say because that's not what the lost or unlearned will remember when they leave there. They're not going to remember the little bit they got right. They're going to be raptured up in, well, they're probably scared to death with the back against the wall, but, but they're going to be more focused on this other stuff. So the purpose of the church is to promote the word of God, not alienate men. The second one we have here is the purpose of the word is to convict men of sin. Uh, so the purpose of the word of God is to convict men of sin. Look at it at 24. But if all prophesy, there is, and there come in one that believeth not, or one is unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all. Um, I find uh, this is very interesting because in a way it, it contradicts um, 22 in a way uh, when you look at it. Uh, Prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. But the idea here is this. Uh, prophesying in 22 was for the church to grow. But what we're talking about here is how it comes in on those that, that don't have a whole lot of education, that are unbelievers. It's not the sense of madness, but they do understand what's going on, and then they can judge for themselves. So understanding that, there's a little bit of difference here. And, and hey, listen, I could be wrong, but that's how I see this passage at this point. Um, ask me 20 years later, and I might change my mind. Anyway, so what Paul is doing at this point, he's contrasting the, the speaking of tongues uh, which may not be understood by some, uh, to enlightenment and to understanding. He said it's better for the unbelieving to be enlightened in our churches than confused. Wouldn't you agree with that? I would. He says right here, but of all prophecy, there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned. He is convinced. He can be convicted of all his wrongdoings, of all. He can He can be, he is judged of all. There's, the word of God is the judge and they have to understand it. Um, so it's better for the church, the person, the name of God. It's better for all men if they're given the word of God than, than something they don't understand. Um, ignorance of the truth of God's word is what really is what Satan wants. He wants that in all of our churches. He wants uh, for every person that hears the word of God to be confused or ignorant of it. He doesn't want anybody to know the truth. Um, he wants to hide the glorious gospel, the glorious truth of the gospel, to them that believe not. He, he, doesn't want them, he doesn't want you to grow as a Christian. He doesn't want the unbeliever to be saved. <clears throat> See, 
the fact here is these people can run in tongues and nobody can understand them. What good does it do anybody? What good does it do the believer that whether he's mature or immature, if he doesn't understand what they're saying? What good does it do the unbeliever if he doesn't understand them? If you give him the wrong impression, what good is it? See, it is by the truth of God's word that real convictions come upon uh, men. That, and, and, and the point is a lot to this because we also, there's an idea of hearkening, of listening to obey. Um, but it's still by the word of God that men come to understand their sin. They understand that when 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 they, they realize who God is, the Almighty God, they realize who they are before an Almighty God. Uh, and that's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we preach and teach with understanding to these people, uh, the Holy Spirit um, convinces them of all. It is his job to um, bring the conviction by the word of God in the hearts and lives of those men. So as one that prophesies, and I'm, I'm using this term with the idea of not foretelling future as much as uh, preaching, teaching. Well, let's just put it this way. Uh, I believe in this case, those that prophesy are, are, are those that are called to rebuke, exhort, admonish, uh, comfort, and teach God's word. Um, and so that is, uh, we say, the, the expounding of God's word by divine influence. And so with that said, and I know we have prophets in the Old Testament. We, we have preachers today that, that are not under that divine influence. But with that said, I think uh, anybody in a position to preach or teach or exhort should be um, uh, somebody, especially preaching and stuff in the church, be men moved by the Spirit of God. You know, if God has not moved you as a young man to be a pastor, then you shouldn't be a pastor. Um, I really have drug my feet on it for a long time because I didn't think that the first man position was what God wanted me to do, but he made it evident. Um, there's nothing wrong with taking your time. There's nothing wrong with waiting on God to show the way. <clears throat> but once he does, and he leads you in that direction, it's on you as a child of God to speak in words that those listening will be able to understand, that they'll be able to grip. <clears throat> and as I said, you can you can expound your knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. You can speak in any tongue that you might language God might have given you, but if those that you're speaking to don't understand, if the listener cannot comprehend, uh, what good is it? All your education is for naught if you can't communicate to those you're speaking to the truth of God's word. That's the essence. It's not about what I can do. It's not about who I am. I, I think this is something um, we really need to get a hold of in our churches today. We, um, we're so worried about uh, how we look, how we present. Uh, and I, I do think you need to be careful. I, I do think that, that you don't need to, to wear skin-tight clothes, and I don't think yoga pants and, and, and clothes that are so tight um, if somebody's standing next to you and, and, and the threads break, you knock them out. I don't think that's appropriate in church. Uh, however, you know, sometimes you may have to wear that because you don't have the funds. But it should not be your desire to wear that stuff. You should. It actually should produce some shame. Um, so I kind of got off track a little bit, so let me get back to where I'm talking about. Uh, we're talking about the message and, and the preaching and teaching God's word should benefit uh, those that will listen, that, that that are sitting under it. They should be able to grip it and understand. Uh, I want to just say two things about the messages. First of all, there should be parts of the message for that will be beneficial to, to every individual in, in, in hearing. So if, if you preach in a church, if you preach what God wants you to preach and in the manner you he would have you preach, there should be parts of that message for every individual to grow in maturity in Christ. Now, I'm not saying every part is for every person. I don't believe that. But I do believe God knows the, the, the individual's spiritual needs. He knows what I need. He knows what you need. He knows what every member needs. And sometimes, and I found this to be quite 
interesting. Um, I'll preach and, and somebody will come to me and thank me for mentioning something and I'm sitting there scratching my head thinking, I don't ever say anything about that. You know, where did you get that? Um, but God uses things and, and our, we all think differently. Our experiences have been differently, but he uses the word of God to trigger things and to teach us things. And so he knows what you need. You just need to be attentive. <clears throat> and with that in mind, let me just say this. The ability for any individual, any person, to grasp the truths of the Word of God really is dependent on the heart. Um, I understand that you need to be saved, but even unsaved people sometimes have stand understanding in the Word of God. That's by the Spirit of God and His application. But it's really dependent on the heart. Do you really want to know? I believe that if a person wants to be saved and they're, they're not saved, I think, first of all, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in them. I think if they'll continue to pray and seek, God will send somebody to them where he will put them in a place where they'll hear more of the Word of God and they'll be saved. I honestly believe that. Now, God tells us uh, that he will draw all men to him. The problem is usually a heart problem when people are, are, are unable to grasp the truth. And maybe it's the speaker. Maybe the speaker's had a bad week, or maybe he's something's happened and he's in the flesh. Uh, you know, we're not perfect, not at all. Or maybe it's the listener. Maybe the listener comes and on the way to church, they had a knockdown, drag out fight, or maybe they found out that their house burnt down, the dog got kicked, or whatever it was. But all of a sudden now, you know, their heart is not where it should be. Sunday would have been you froze to death. Um, but anyway, no matter whether they're saved or not, uh, we have two basic understandings. One, God always communicates his word correctly, but men are not always prepared. In other words, sometimes the pastor's heart is off. The speaker's heart is not where it should be. And so what he gets from God is God gives it 100%, but maybe he only gets 35, 40%. Well, then how about the listening? The listener's carnal that week or, or whatever, having difficulties, and, and maybe he doesn't get but 25%. So you're getting 25% of my 35%, or let's say I get 25 and you get 25. So I get a quarter of the message from God, and you get a quarter of God's message from me. You see what I'm saying? But if I have a good week, I might, I might be in as much in tune with God as I can, and I get 75%. And then you come and you get 75% or 80% from me. You understand what I'm saying? The application of the word of God is always the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but we do have a part. It is important for me as a speaker to come with a heart prepared to minister the word of God. Um, it is important for me as a speaker to ensure that my heart is, is free from unconfessed sin, uh, from any kind of iniquity, but you also have an obligation as the listener to come prepared not only to listen, but to confess your sin and surrender everything to God. If he points something out in the message, you need to respond. But you should have, before you've ever gotten to the service, prepared your heart for the Word of God. You say, well, Pastor, that's your job. Uh, no, my job is to prepare my heart and to prepare the message and be in tune with God when I get there. But what about you? Do you not have an obligation to be in tune with God as well? Sure we do. Um, and if we are where we're supposed to be, we'll get convinced or convicted of sin. And that, that understanding, we'll feel like we've been judged. We'll feel like we have to get it right, and we'll go to God and get it right. And that's what we ought to be doing. That leads us to the last point. The purpose of conviction is for the worship of God. <clears throat> now, you could have done this a hundred different ways. I don't have a problem with any way to. You could have said the purpose of conviction is, is, is for the saving of men. Totally true. To get them to turn to God. But look at the verse. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face. Hmm. Prone position before God. 
He will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. And what happens when we report that God is in, in somebody else? Is not God glorified? Is not he worshiped for all he's doing? Sure he is. So, first of all, <clears throat> it says, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. It is by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's use of the Word of God, a person's heart is revealed to them. This is, is really, I think, an, an interesting point we need to understand. Um, ministry has been interesting. Uh, my own life and my spiritual growth has been very interesting. You know, we think we know ourselves. We think we understand everything about ourselves. And, and then we get, and we're reading in the Word of God. Maybe you've been saved for 10 or 15 years, and all of a sudden you read something, you go, oh, that's me. You know, I need to take care of that. See, it's by the Spirit's use of the Word of God that, that He reveals things in our lives. That's your heart. That's sin in your heart that you need to get out. See, I, I have come to find out in life that many people don't know their own hearts and, and they don't know the desires uh, like they think they do. You know, when you start asking people, um, you can ask people sometimes what their favorite color is and they'll go, I think green. Well, you know, no, no, I really like blue better. Really? You know, I'd probably do it too because it's just the way it is. We, we do not, when you apply that on the spiritual level, you go back in the Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible talks about men, men being, God understood that men were evil continually from their youth. He understood their hearts. Um, see, men don't believe their heart are, are desperately wicked. God knows that. He knows what's in the heart of man, but men don't know. We think we know, but we really don't know uh, how wicked we are. <clears throat> and when we're confronted with the word of God, <clears throat> we say, oh, I'm not like that. I can remember a young man um, in my past, and as I would deal with him, he'd say, oh, no, 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 no. I say, this is truth. He said, oh, no, no, I'm true. Oh, no, no, no. He wouldn't believe anything he said out the word of God. What do you do with somebody like that? Well, the, the fact is, the word of God reveals what's hidden in the heart, but you can reject it. This tells us what's in the heart of man. When truth is revealed to a person, they're going to either accept or reject it. If, if, if they reject that truth that has been given to them or, or is illuminated by the Holy Spirit, what that tells you is they're going to continue in sin. And so when I deal with people and they're like that, what can I do? Uh, they have either rejected the Holy Spirit's illumination and what he's revealed to them, or, or he hasn't even revealed it to them yet. Either way, if they don't accept what I'm saying, there's nothing I can do. It takes a moving of the Spirit in that life to change them. And those who willingly receive the truth, and, and, and they, what happens is they receive that truth and they understand that conviction. That's conviction. Oh, Lord, look what I have done. I have, that is sin in my life. I've sinned against you. Is that enough? Well, that's a real good start because they, they have a conviction. They have an understanding of their sinfulness. Any man, any woman, any child under, the, under conviction for sin are in a very great position to see great changes, great blessings in their life. But see, conviction's not enough. He says here, thus all the secrets of his, of his heart made manifest. They, they, he understood them. They, they, were, they appeared. They were made apparent. They were visible to him. And so falling down on his face, that's the next step. To be under conviction is just not enough. There has to be a response to that conviction. This person here, and so falling down on his face, he realized his position. He realized by the illumination the Spirit did in his life who God was. He realized his wickedness. Um, let me just say this. If there is no response, there's not going to be any lasting fruit. Um, there's no lasting fruit from conviction if there's no decision made. It just doesn't happen. 
The fruit comes from the decision. You know, I know that was wrong for me to say that, but that's just the way I am. There's no, there's not going to be any change. Yeah, I know that cigarettes will kill me, but you know what? I'm going to smoke them till I die. They got the truth. They understand it, but they're not changing. They're not acting upon that. Well, you, they could, yeah, they're refusing uh, to change. Um, the spiritual need of a person is brought out by the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, but they have to decide to act upon what, what the Spirit tells them. Um, uh, as our, our needs and as these uh, problems or, or, or sins are brought to our knowledge, it is our responsibility to, to surrender them. Uh, if it's something we've held on to, then to, um, to give it over to God. The, if not, then there's a need to abstain, to, to seek forgiveness and to depart from that sin. Um, again, conviction is not enough. This person here, um, he fell down on his face, right? Look at what it says after that. It says he will worship God. And so falling down on his face, he will, future tense, because his secrets were, of the heart was, was brought to his understanding, and because he was willing to fall down before God in reverence, that's a decision, he will worship God. See, when these sins are revealed to us, if we refuse to give them up and we hold on to them, um, we're not going to fall down before God. We're unrepentant. But if we do repent, then we can ask God for strength. We can ask him to help us to gain the victory over that sin. We have a whole world of tools. We have a whole world of the Spirit of God being uh, willing to help us to get through this. But if you don't, you don't have that access. You, I mean, you just shut yourself off. He says he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth because of what's happened in his life, because of the decisions he's made based on understanding the prophesying, the preaching and teaching of the word of God, he's changed. And because of that, he can go out and proclaim that God is in you. <clears throat> the fact is this. People need to see God. I don't care if they're in unbelief. I don't care if they're a carnal Christian. I don't care if they're a mature Christian or a new Christian. Everybody needs to see God, and they need to see them in him and us. Um, but unfortunately, the problem is many times the child of God is not living their life like they should, and because of that, they hide God from from the, the, the people's sight. They don't see him in you because they see the world in you. Let me, and, and I'm going to wrap this up a little quickly, uh, I think. Let me just say these few things. It's on every child of God to live a life that reveals God to men, or so men might might know him. That, that's on us. Um, and when we live that life, what happens is, what's in the end of this? It says, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. He will begin to, uh, once he sees God in our lives, he will begin to seek to speak or people will begin to speak of what they see. People are going to talk, good or bad. I mean, people are going to talk. You're not going to hide that from them. And, and it's really, it's better for them to talk good about the, the, the body of Christ than bad. We need to live for God. And so what is said will be a blessing to the church. It will be a blessing to the name and testimony of God. If we don't, um, the testimonies that will be spread by men, um, it will bring reproach and dishonor to the church, to you, and to God's name. Um, with, with that said, uh, if you haven't caught it by, by now, uh, I'll just make this statement. Living for God is just not a Sunday tradition. It's a lifestyle. It's something we do day after day after day based on our faith in God. It's not, it's not just a tradition. We can forget that. Paul is telling us here as a God's children that our worship service to God should have an order to it. Uh, he's, uh, he's saying this requires you as a child of God 
to live a disciplined life. You need to have discipline in your church services. You need to plan for the service. And, and when people come to church, uh, they need to be prepared to deal with whatever sin God might reveal to them in their lives. If you um, have been around me long enough, you understand that, that I believe that every child of God has an obligation to God when we enter his house to worship. Uh, when I, as a preacher, enter in with the message God has given me, uh, that message should have already been applied to my heart. I should have already dealt with those things in my own life before I ever open my mouth to you. Um, I also must be prepared to give the, the message God has given me to others. And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes it's very difficult. But the truth is we're here to promote the Word of God. We're here to, to glorify the name of God. We're here to see people saved and come to know him as personal Savior. I mean, that's that's the whole job. Um, and if we're going to have God use us, we need to make sure our vessels are pure and prepared for his purpose. Uh, very important for this. As a listener, uh, I encourage you to come to these uh our online services with your heart prepared and ready to make a decision for Christ, uh, whatever it be, a change, a surrender, or whatever it is. Um, if it's sin, to repent of it. Anytime the Spirit of God does convict of sin or, or whatever it is he's dealing with you, I hope that you'll have a willingness to, uh, to come before God and kneel in his presence and deal with whatever it is. I reiterate again before I close, it's never enough just to be under conviction. Too many people sit in the services, they get convicted, God deals with them on something, and they don't deal with God. They wait, the altar call goes, they never go up, they never deal with it, and, and, and they go home, no decision made. I don't push uh, the people to come up, but... If you knew how strongly I feel about that, um, I have found that if you don't go up, you don't make a decision. If you don't have enough courage to walk up to the front, well, if you can't kneel, you can stand, but if you don't have enough front, uh, courage to walk up to the front and deal with God, then typically you're not going to deal with God. You're not going to make a decision, and things will go right on like they are. How unfortunate. How unfortunate. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you again for this day. I thank you for each and every one that's able to listen tonight. I pray for those who weren't able to be with us tonight. And I ask the Lord that you would uh, help them uh, set aside some time. And they might uh, spend some time uh, listening to the word of God and take their Bible and follow along and study that they might grow spiritually might grow closer to you in your relationship. Father, we love and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, and you have a good evening, and we'll see you Sunday.